Blake, what's going on? I'm good, I'm good. Thanks for stopping in. Yeah, it's good to get the pleasure to sit down with you and you know what I mean, get your insight on things um, when it comes to Pan, Pan in New York City, um, and just, you know, how you, how you feel about certain things. Okay, cool. So you were born in Belmont, Trinidad. You began playing Pan at six years old. How did that start up? Yeah, I always say six years old, but it could be, it could be before that. Where I was born in Sinbarbs is the hills of Belmont. There was a band next to me that my cousins played in. I had an uncle that played there. So when they weren't playing, I would run over there and bang and probably make noise and be a nuisance. So I've always been exposed to Pan. I don't even remember myself when Pan wasn't there. So where we lived right next door was a steel band. And I always heard them. I'd go there and do crazy stuff. We're in Belmont because my grandmother is from Belmont, and she won't. If she had this interview and she, she had, I didn't ask you what part of Belmont because she's gonna be asking me and asking. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's and yeah. So we're from St. Bob. So I think your mother's from maybe Bradford Street. So mm -hmm. they're down on the flat. So we're on the hills on St. Bob's. If you keep going up St. Bob's, you actually get to Lavender Hill and Desperados. If you go all the way, right. you know, you keep going. So we're on the hills of, of Belmont. Nice. And then you came to Brooklyn like around nine years old. Correct? Yeah, I came, yeah, definitely. I came to Brooklyn at nine, yeah. What what high school did you go to? I went to Erasmus. Oh, Erasmus. To, yeah. <laughs> How was it back in those days? It was, it was, because we know well, the reputation Erasmus had. In the, I went there when I went to Erasmus in 76. Mm. So in the 70s, New York was a different place. Mm when I was growing up, it didn't seem that strange, but looking back at it with, you know, adult lens of the gentrified Brooklyn was totally different. So Erasmus was, um, when I came there, had a, a lot of Caribbean students there. Um, a few decades before they had more, um, they had white students, but when I went there, it was predominantly Caribbean and African Americans there. So it was cool for me, you know, it was close to home and, um, but I enjoyed my four years there. All right. So when you when you came to Brooklyn, was there like a pan scene already going on? Yeah, when I came to Brooklyn in seventy two, as I said, I was nine. I didn't even think about pan for the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. But there was definitely a pan scene. You know, mm -hmm. pan in Brooklyn probably is big. I think Rudy King probably brought pan in New York probably in maybe the 50s or 60s. So right. when I came, there was an established pansy, but mm. I wasn't involved mm. my initial years. My first couple of years, 72, 73, I wasn't involved in pan at all. As a matter of fact, we, I lived right around here in Flatbush, yeah. and me and some American guys, we had a, a, a band. <laughs> where I was a drummer, but we were playing like funk stuff. And What was the name of the band? We called it North Stars. I named it after Pan of North Stars. Oh, so wow. We had that band and, you know, it wasn't much. We just played some funk riffs and I just kept my one rhythm. But then in 74, I went to Trinidad for the summer and I got re-engaged with Pan. My cousin, David Mondi, who's, um, who taught me before I came to Brooklyn, he lived on Sinbad's and he showed me a couple of tunes on a double ten. I was like, so that was 74 summer. I was like, man, when I go back to Brooklyn, I got to, find a steel band and in 75 right. I started playing in steel bands in in Brooklyn which band it was a band called Exhibit Serenaders mm. so I think the year before that there was an exhibit was a kind of offshoot of Despers but when I joined the band I think 75 Despers USA started so this was a band called Exhibit Serenaders but Mikey Enoch you know legendary Brooklyn pan man tuner arranger player he was in the band. Mm. Um, Kendall Williams' parents were in the band too, Holly wow. and Jenny. They were in the band that first year. And um, Baby Pierre, I don't know if you know that name, he passed away. Mm. He's a great musician. So it was a, a small band and it had more, at least in 75, it had more adults. The adult to me when I'm like 11 or 12 is, means I'm like 25. Right. They were like <laughs> grown men. They had one other young guy in the band at that time. But there were other bands. Mm -hmm. So that year wasn't, we were in a major band, but um, that was my first band in 75. 
and panorama was going on around them time? Yeah, panorama was going on in 75, mm. but the band I was in didn't take part. Okay. You know, the named bands then was like Brooklyn Airs was big and maybe been like Pine Masters. Sonata's been around forever. So mm -hmm. those bands may have been, I think 75 probably had a panorama. Brooklyn Airs probably won that, but the band I was in in 75 didn't, didn't mm -hmm. enter. So we had this little band on Bedford and what was that like Sterling Street? Mm -hmm. And we practiced in a basement. So that was my first year. Who used to arrange for um, Brooklyn Airs, if you remember? Oh, Brooklyn Airs? Yeah. Okay. So Brooklyn, I didn't join Brooklyn Airs yet, but Brooklyn Airs, when I joined them mm -hmm. in, in 77, I joined Brooklyn Airs. That was Leon Sterling was the arranger. But mm -hmm. I think in 75, I wasn't in the band. The arranger was Leon Sterling and Winston Wellington. Okay. But I never played under Winston. I, I was in, you know, Exhibit Serenaders that, that 75. All right. So eventually you, um, you arranged for Metro. You arranged for Despers USA, and you arranged for Pan Rebels. Um, what was your experience with each band? Let's let's start with um, Metro. What year did you arrange? Well, and what song did you? Arrange? Yeah, Metro. I never arranged a Panorama song. So Metro, oh, okay. my role in Metro, I did a couple of verse and chorus pieces. So that would have been in the um, the mid '80s. I joined Metro in '81. Okay. So I probably, every year, well, I wouldn't say every year, but a lot of years I would do like a verse and chorus type tune. Um, so I know definitely in 87, I probably did some 88. But in 1990, Clive Radley was the arranger. He's more or less he was the arranger for the time I was there. I think Denzel Botas arranged a year or two when I was okay. there, when Bradley didn't come. But in 1990, Bradley was doing Tell Me Why. He was the arranger. And somewhere, like in the six minute of the song, he said, like, Gavin, I want you to do a solo. So then I went home and I did some crazy stuff mm. and came back and did like a 64 bar solo. So I didn't arrange the song, but I, right. I played a part. I have, right. my music is documented in that song, nice. you know. Nice. So that was my arranging experience with um, Metro. And how was it like working with Bradley at that time? I mean, Bradley was great. I mean, he um, he kind of let me do whatever I wanted to do, he, you know. So I never really studied with Bradley in a mm. formal sense, oh, yeah. but his impact on me was um, immeasurable in the sense that when I played under Bradley starting in 1981, was the year Bradley started with Metro, I came that same year mm. to Metro. Um, what I was able to do was I played double second, but I learned, I knew the double second part because I played double second, but I also knew the tenor parts. I learned the double tenor part. So I kind of knew all of the parts. So I kind of figured out my arranging method was to see what he's doing and try to come up in my mind with some logic, what was going on there. And fortunately, Bradley's music is really deeply rooted. It's organic. It comes right out of the music. So I came up with my own theories of what he was doing. I don't think it really captured everything he was doing. So he, um, he encouraged me, liked me, I think, anyway, for the most part. And, um, you know, he, he gave me encouragement and inspiration, whatever he, I mean, I used to run down to, I used to play ball and then run down just to hear what Bradley would do next. So that was, um, so that was a, a great experience, you know, just being around Bradley. Cause he was a, he was just like an all-around brilliant guy. Right. So he was this great musician. But he was also this great thinker. So that was, um, you know, I'm forever grateful for, for being in his presence for 10 years, more or less. Yeah. Right. How about with Despers USA? Well, Despers USA, in 1990, the band won the panorama with this mm -hmm. Tell Me Why thing. Then there was a split. There was a metro was formed. Well, they, they're not formed. They kept the name and went to Woodruff with mm -hmm. Tony Joseph and his brother Brian and some other people. I think Lyndon Spencer, mm -hmm. uh, Papa Chung, he was in that. But I stayed with the Fulton Street squad, mm -hmm. which was Clement Franklin, who was Odie's father, man, yep. um, those guys. Yeah. So that was cool. The, the first year I arranged, I, either I was brave, naive, or stupid. 
<laughs> or combination. It's probably somewhere I wrote my own tune. This is mm. Pan Romance. I wrote this my own composition that I originally written for my wife. Then I changed it and um, not really changed it because I didn't really have the lyrics. And I arranged it for Despers USA. So it was um, so that was that was interesting. I was like, you know, until the results came out, it was like, wasn't that much fun? Mm. So that that was cool. Then the next year. I guess I got gunshot out of band, felt, you know, let's play something more mainstream. So I think the first year we came like sixth. I was like, mm. oh man, this panorama thing is painful. Oh, yeah. um, then the next year we switched to a Baron song. I think, what was that? Um, Sweetness is my weakness. And we came second, mm. was a, which was a surprise to me that we came second. And so that was my experience arranging for Despots USA. But why was it a surprise to you? What's, that we came. That y'all came second. You know, as a young, this is my second year mm-hmm. arranging, so I'm not really, um, I'm going there to win. I mean, I remember Bradley had left the band. And that year, I think Bradley was doing Dingley. I don't know if you ever heard about the, yeah, the fabled Dingley. I yeah. mean, Bradley came down and said, he would come by the band. He was like, well, Gavin, that's so good. He said, but here what? The race is for second. I was like, oh, <laughs> man. So um, I had, we held on and we got second, mm. you know, so... Um, so, this, so that was um, so that was encouraging. Mm-hmm. Then then I left Despers USA. I didn't. I mean, the whole steel band thing. I'm always not sure if it's something I want to be involved in. So the direction they were going in and the way I felt I needed to go didn't mesh. And then I took like a year off or two. Yeah, I think I took a year off. Then I went to Pan Rebels. Mm-hmm. And what what year you went? And what song y'all did? With Pan Rebels. Yeah. Pan Rebels, I went to Pan Rebels in, I think, 94. Mm-hmm. And we did um, Fire Coming Down, a mm-hmm. Robert Greenwich composition that Super Blue sang. Mm-hmm. And so that, that was cool. That was a different experience, a different band, different vibe. Um, so that, that was, that was a, a good experience. We all placed that year. We came second again. So, oh, I'm, nice. like, <laughs> so, so I'm holding down these second places. Uh, so then the next year was 95. Mm. Then I did On the Road, which is Ronnie McIntosh tune, and then we came third with that one, mm. which I actually think that's the, the best song I probably probably did, um, but um, the results didn't didn't show. And after that, I then again I had to reassess this whole panorama, my lifestyle, what I wanted to do with my family, and the direction this thing is going in. And essentially, that was it. I retired from. From arranging, so. so kind of, kind of talk about that because you you had some success in arranging. You came second twice. You came third. It's not like you were facing last or you know, anything like that. And you you spoke about um, the direction you wanted to go in. Kind of, kind of talk about that. The the direction you felt steel bands were going in at the time and direction you wanted to go in. Yeah. Well, I think it's maybe the direction I wanted to go in, and I also assess what I envisioned then i looked at myself and said i don't think i have the time or the ability to move this art form or what was going on in new york in the direction that i would be comfortable doing year in year out you know so it's one that i didn't necessarily like the direction you know without getting into all of the detail Mm -hmm. and two i was thinking that i didn't have the skills or the time or the energy to try to move this mm-hmm. in a different way. So I, maybe you could say I copped out and said, you know what, you know, I got to do that time. My daughter was born in 93. I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm better off spending my summers going in the parks and um, doing that, mm-hmm. you know? So I was never this person that passed my life and all this. I mm-hmm. was always something I did in addition to a whole bunch of other things. So it, right. it, it didn't, um, it wasn't working for me. Mm. I think musically, um, it was okay. And plus, I didn't, never felt that I needed judges behind a museum or anywhere to validate what I'm doing. Right. So whether I came third, second, first, mm-hmm. or last, I wouldn't want to come last, but, you know, there's, um, that doesn't feel good. But I don't need those people to validate what I was doing. So I, I was okay saying that I don't care. If I never win, that, that's okay. Uh, musically, that's not going to define me. All right. So if somebody was to call you right now, like, Garvin, we really love you as a musician. We love what you do. And we would love for you to arrange for us. You would, you would turn it down. 
Yeah, I don't think I'm in, into the arrangement. Plus, I don't think musically I'm into arranging. You know, I would have to go and change gears, and no, I, I don't think I don't think so. But I, I'll, I'll tell them speak to my agent. <laughs> no. uh, you know, so that arranging thing I think is is behind me. So just one last thing on the whole steel band arranging thing, especially like in New York City. Um, we don't want to get into detail about. Um, what's wrong or more on a like solution based theory. Like what do you, what do you want to see when it comes to the steel band community in New York city or just the steel band scene period? It doesn't necessarily have to be steel band or Panorama. Like what well, would you like to see? Let me take a shot at the New York thing. Cause I'm not involved in a steel band. So I really don't want to speak for steel bands. I don't know what the steel bands want. Is it a Panorama focused thing? Mm -hmm. which has its merits, or is it something mm -hmm. more that they want to have um, groups that gig all over the place? So, you know, I, I don't think I have a solution, but if I focus on Panorama, what, what I would like to happen in New York, I can't speak for Trinidad, is that we probably need a better produced show. You know, I'm not going to get into the results and the judging because that's always going to be right. controversial if you win. Subjective you think the judges well, were great. Yeah. But I think what's consistent in New York, outside of maybe one year they get lucky, is the production of the show has been awful. Mm -hmm. And I think being in New York City, you should be able to produce a good show. Right. The results are always going to be controversial. Right. The judges are always going to be suspect. You know, um, they, it's like anything else, they probably could do better with the judges, but it probably won't change the results that much. Mm -hmm. it, probably the same bands would win. What would be the same three or four bands would be challenging for um, supremacy. But I think the bands deserve a better show for themselves because the hard work they put in for like three months or two months mm -hmm. and the audience deserve a better show. Mm -hmm. We need better sound. You know, I could say sound three times. It, need, it just needs to be produced better. In terms of what the bands need, I'm not going to be... Um, don't want to speak to that because I'm 30 years out of that. I would let the band say what they want, you know, monetarily. Maybe they need more. I, I don't know. I know one thing that Panorama is an expensive mm -hmm. event to produce. You know, that's the nature of the instrument. Not the instrument, but the, the steel band. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, you, sure. you want to have 100 people. You want to have 80 and you want five bands to have 80 people for people to be rewarded monetarily, what they would think fairly, you're going to need a big, big budget. Mm. That, I, I don't know how you do that math. Mm. All right. Um, so I remember um, seeing you play for the first time in Sugar Cane, downtown Brooklyn. Um, I think we were playing after y'all, the family band. Oh, okay. Yeah, me, Pops. The twins. I don't even think KJ was playing with us at the time. Okay, maybe but, not. Um, one thing that stood out for me personally is your touch. Like you, you have a really, really unique touch that you. I really can't say I've 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 heard anybody else with your your touch, your styling, your tone. Um, speak about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean the the touch and the tone. Is that something that I um really think about, I think what may have, have helped it is that I, I played in steel bands, but most of the refinement of my technique was done in a bedroom or in this type of setting. So I was forced to play, not be a, a banger, mm. but I don't want to bang because I think pan, as beautiful an instrument as it is, it, it gets to a point where it stops being a pleasant sounding instrument like any instrument it has a threshold so i never really wanted to get above that threshold but i also didn't want to play like i'm just tipping yeah, so it's yeah. it's something that i just worked on you know um i always felt that the best way to do that as i look back is to expend the least amount of energy to take the shortest routes to notes not mm -hmm. raise your hands too high mm -hmm. stay center and um 
So it, it's just something that probably evolved over time, you know, probably watching other players play, but that may not have been it because most of the players that I've seen, it was probably in a panorama setting where you tend to play with more, more force, right. you know? So my goal has always been to, if that note is not going to sound good, if I can't make this run and that E flat is going to start getting ugly, I can't make that run. I, I'm not going to play that. You know, I could probably physically get there, mm -hmm. but I need to get to the note and have control when I get there. So if I get to that note, I dictate the sound, not just I like get there with my hand and whatever comes out because I just, nah, I need to get there and be in full control of the notes as much as possible. You know, that doesn't always happen. Right, right. So you're still performing? Yeah, I'm still. Still, still. Yeah, I'm still, um, you know, I've always been like a part-time musician. You know, you do this, you do your other stuff, you do it on the side. Yeah, but I'm still, you know, still performing, still learning, still, right. you know, every, every day you get in on the pan, it's like, oh man, I wish I knew this 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a player too. It's like, so yeah, I'm always, that's where you really learn. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can learn practicing whatever scales, but you really learn by mounting up with other live people, counting it one, two, three. That's where you learn. Mm -hmm. You get your butt kicked. Is it like, oh man, I really didn't know that. So, short definitely, answer, yeah, I'm still definitely. still performing. Definitely. So, how long do you see yourself performing? Until the hands don't work anymore. Nice, nice. Yeah, until the they could get slow, <laughs> but I'm okay with that. But yeah, I plan to go down playing because it's something that I I really enjoy, and I feel there's there's so much more for me to learn on the instrument. Every time I said it's like there's more. Stuff things to learn. And the unique thing about Pan is the music part of it is ubiquitous. It's all over, you know, music theory. But what I enjoy is finding out ways that on my double second, it's like, how do I maneuver this thing more effectively so I could express myself mm -hmm. better? So that that's my lifelong goal to keep seeing if I could do this thing, execute better on this instrument. Yeah, and I feel like that's a key. Always, always, always knowing that you don't know it all, and there's so much to learn, and it's it's it's, it's never ending, really. Yeah, it's it's, like... you could go on and on and on and on and on, and just when you think, nope, you got to start all over. Again. Yeah, that I mean, that's the it's the fun, and it's also the frustration. You know, it's like, oh man, it's like, oh, I really can't do this, or I can't play this. It's like, oh, I should have done this. Five years ago, I never learned. But it, 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 that's what makes music or art in general beautiful. Is this? It's different than, than sports. I used to play basketball way back in the day until um, I couldn't do it anymore. The, what I really like about music is that you know once you have some dexterity, you keep doing this thing right. forever. You don't have to keep reminiscing. But I remember when we used to play. In Foster Park, it's like, no, nah, it's like what I'm doing next week. Right. That's what I like about music. Right. So I reminisce about ball and all of that, but that music is something you go down. And a lot of artists like that, whether it's literature, you're a writer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, so, yeah, I keep, I plan to keep doing it once I've got some strength. So you released two or three albums? Two. Two. One is, um, Parallel Overtones, mm -hmm. and the other one is Bella E. Rose Blues, right? Yeah, Bella Road Blues, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's, Bella Road is a part of Belmont, too, you know, mm -hmm. it's um, the other side of St. Bob's, Bella Road is one side, and St. Francois Valley Road is and the that, other that side. that album came out first, right? Yeah, that came out first, that came out a long time ago, it came out, so they, I saw it recorded probably in the late 90s, probably, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that was my first one I did, and then um, and that being your first album, like, what did that mean mean to you? Oh. Yeah, it was it was special. You know, the first is always special, and I at that time I was playing with um, well, I wouldn't say some South Africa, but Tony Cedras, who's from South Africa, so he was instrumental in um, nudging me to do it. So he was involved in that. Damon Dwight, who still plays with me on drums, he was mm -hmm. there, and then Frankie came in towards the end 
Mm. Raph was supposed to be on it, but then Raph couldn't get to New York. He had some other stuff, so mm. Frankie did it. So, so it was great. Um, it was great meeting these musicians and the fact that they were in the play on the album. These were like leading musicians. I'm right. like, man, they're taking a risk. <laughs> you know, I don't want to sully their names. <laughs> But um, so so that that was great. That was a good experience. And then parallel overtones. Frankie played on most. On, yeah, Frankie on, played on that, and he arranged most of the arranged pieces. He did, mm-hmm. yeah, because we were playing at Sugarcane for off, on and off for maybe like ten years, and then we did like a Lincoln Center thing. I think we did that twice, and we had a couple of pieces that people like, like Afraid and Pan and Harmony. Mm-hmm. So I decided to I probably should record them. For posterity so that's what drove that and so it's essentially what stuff we used to play at sugarcane and then frankie wrote a song for Bugsy that was on that too and he did a, um a kind of reharmonization of sparrows no money no love which is mm. i still struggle playing it it's like <laughs> why'd you do that to me man so any um upcoming albums well the plan is i'm hoping next year to do some recording, but now I don't know if an album is the right thing to do, mm. or do you just make good professional videos and <laughs> use that? So I don't know, but I plan to do some sort of professional recording, right. whether it'll be an album, whether it'll be, um, I don't know, but because we've started to come with some new repertoire and always like to document what I'm doing at different stages of my evolution, if you want to call it that. Then, yeah. So next year I'm gonna record some something. Nice. So just a couple more questions. Um, so I like to ask everybody that I interview, what is your Mount Rushmore of pan players? I don't really have a Mount Rushmore of pan players. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think playing falls into a few categories, and I've seen people in the different categories. Um, there's one, kind of like two categories, roughly. One is people who really execute music beautifully. Mm-hmm. So they're more like coming out of the classical tradition. Right. You give them a piece of music mm-hmm. and they execute it flawlessly. It's smooth. The phrasing is right. You know, the, the dynamics are right. So there's people that are really great at that. And then there are some people that are good improvisers. So more like improvisers, like soloists. Solo, I mean, I don't want to say a, a Mount Rushmore because I grew up in Brooklyn. Mm. So a lot of the players that I've heard of mm. is like a, I didn't see them up close, mm. but like everyone kind of knows the name. You know, you got mm. people like Earl Rodney. I did hear Earl Rodney and I heard, I heard Earl Rodney, Bugsy and Robert which I guess you would, most people would consider them in the Mount Rushmore, if, mm-hmm. you, if that's the term. Mm-hmm. In Spiral Hideaway, I was in Trinidad. Mm-hmm. That would be like late 70s. Mm-hmm. And I heard the three of them. So they certainly you know, deserve that type of um, mm-hmm. accolades. Three completely different approach to the instrument. Mm-hmm. you know. And then, um, then eventually I was exposed to to Rudy Smith, who's, um, mm-hmm. you know, he's a great player too, mm-hmm. you know, different approach. But then I've met people, as I said, who don't improvise that I could hear them play all day right. just because they're just accurate. Right, you know, right. Despots have some of them, like the Cease um, Gonga did, mm. you know. Um, he's He didn't improvise, but listening to him play and seeing the way he executed the instrument. He's Mount Rushmore to me. You know, I've never seen any, you know, he's playing like nine bass. I didn't see him on the 12, but he's maneuvering this and rhythmically and the tone, you know, is, um, is as good as, as anything. So it's like me saying that Oscar Peterson is bad, better than Vladimir Horowitz. It's like two different Not better, things. but like, I guess your, your four favorite. Yeah. So I, I don't really have any favorite because it's yeah, like, yeah. I like, I mean, I've heard Jack a couple of times, mm-hmm. Cobra Jack, and, yeah. you know, he's good. So I don't really um, want to say I have a favorite. Because if I have a favorite, that means I have some people that I don't like. So, you know, <laughs> it's normally the usual suspects. 
right. are up there. And some days I like them, and some days I don't like them, and some days I like some. Like, you know who I, I like, and he doesn't probably get as much hearing as he probably deserves? Jason Batiste. I really like him. That's my. That's you know, so he, you know, he has a, a, a nice melodic approach to, um, to complex material. I wouldn't say complex might not be the, the right word. It's not all that complex, but he, he plays sophisticated. And I like his approach. Definitely one of my favorites. You know, so, um, and then there's other people I hear online that I, I think I like them, but they don't play a whole song for me. Mm. Either they're noodling, and it may sound good, but I want to hear someone in a group context mm-hmm. reacting to a rhythm section and playing an entire piece. And so really, really it, improvising. I really improvise, and not just, you know, just, which is cool too. Right. You know, and, and your repertoire needs to be something that I say, okay, this is something this person worked on, and it's just not you just randomly hitting notes rhythmically cool. And so, so there's other people that I think could be mm-hmm. on Mont Rushmore, but I don't really, I can't really judge them because I don't hear an uh, entire piece that they're playing. But, um, but definitely a guy like Bugsy, clearly a guy with definitely. fantastic hearing and, you know, phenomenal reflexes. Um, but you know you gotta like what he's doing. There's people who's not gonna like that. So it's like very true. You know, so it's like anything. Not everybody likes bird, and everybody likes, yeah. you know, train. So mm-hmm. I don't know if I answered the question. I danced around it. No, it's all good. Everybody's <laughs> gonna give a different response. I'm not looking for a uh, response or anything. What but but I, by the way, Gongale's name is was, his name was is Eugene McLean. So he's okay. You know, great player. Despots had some really. They might have some now. I'm not as, as familiar w- with them, uh, but they had some really great people that executed music that you felt it. And when you say Despers, you mean Despers USA? No, I mean Despers and Trinidad. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Despers USA are a good place. Like okay. Odie's father, Clement, he's a, a great technician too. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know him as, as an improviser. Maybe he improvises, but he was a great technician of, of the instrument. Mm-hmm. And I think that gets lost with the... Um, with the amount of emphasis we put on soloists, mm-hmm. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't want to say we or a lot of people losing it. It's like we can't lose track at the end of the day is how your instrument sounds and what you're communicating to people. Whether you practiced it for a million hours, mm-hmm. somebody showed it to you, I really don't care. It's when I hear you, it needs to touch me. And is, is it something that you never practiced and you just did spur the moment? I really don't care. When I hear it, it needs to touch me. And Panorama still has players like that. And I think they get, they get overlooked for the flashy guy who's just going up and down the scale and doing gyrations. And I'm sure I'm familiar with Despers because I played with them. I played in Pandemonium, had great players. So I'm sure the All-Stars has their equivalent. And all of the top bands and probably United and some of the lesser bands have great, great people who can execute the music and we shouldn't lose sight of those people, you know. Um. Most definitely. Um, Frankie McIntosh, a good friend of yours. I see you guys still play together. What, what does he mean to you? Well, I mean, Frankie means everything to me. You know, so Frankie was like, um, kind of like a, a godsend. As I said, I was doing parallel, not parallel, it's Bell Road Blues. And Tony Cedrus and I, he was co-producer and said, oh, just try to get a different feel. So Raph and I were playing together, so we were going to get Raph. But Raph, I think, was in D.C., so he couldn't do it, and I needed to, to finish. So I was like, oh, let me call Frankie. So I, I think Raph gave me that number. So I called Frankie. I was like, Mr. McIntosh, you know, I want you to play. Because I knew about Frankie because I grew up on mm-hmm. the, all of the soca stuff he did. And Raph told me he was a great jazz musician. I didn't know he was a great jazz musician. Mm. Then I called him. He came to the studio and, you know, he, um, he just laid it down. And since then, which was probably, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago, we've become, you know, close friends. He's probably the closest thing I had to like a mentor. Mm. You know, all of Frankie doesn't mentor me in the sense of telling you what to do. Mm. 
but it, it seems like Frank is to me has been a strange teacher to me. He doesn't say, well, Garvin, you should do this, you shouldn't do this. What it seems like he does, he was like, he would recommend a tune that I don't know if he does it consciously or unconsciously, that has something in it that I have to work on. So he would pick, you know, it's like, let's play um, Along Came Betty. It's like, oh shit, I can't play this one. So he kind of teaches you by pointing you to this um, in directions that I may not have gone, or if I went there, it might have taken me forever. And he's, he just is free with his time. He asked Frankie to write a chart. I mean, I've studied harmony when I was in college. I took some harmony class. I have tons of harmony books. But reading a Frankie's reharmonization of a tune that I know, that's the harmony lesson. It's like, you mean these are the chords? You know, so it's that type of thing. And he's like a genuine person. And Frankie, um, he believes in Caribbean musicians. Mm. I was like, Frankie don't need to play with me. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Frankie's, if he wanted to, I guess he did the Calypso thing, is, could have been a world-renowned jazz pianist if he chose to do that, but he chose, you know, a different life. So the fact that he's willing to, to have me stick around him, that, that's a blessing. You know, so I pinch myself every now and then. It's like, man, Frankie's, um, but every time I play with Frankie, I learn something. You know, he, um, you probably play with him. Frankie's not going to tell you, don't play this, don't play that, right. play this. Right. But you could feel the energy, you hear what you're doing, and you hear what he's doing. Nobody got to tell you what you're doing needs to work. So I'm like, what I'm so, you know, that's been, that's been my conservatory for the last twenty something years. Uh, it's nice to always have somebody who could mentor you in, in any capacity. Right. You know, I mean, it doesn't have to necessarily be like a, a, a critical mentorship or someone who's constantly advising. You know what I mean? Um, Frankie just has that natural vibe. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a, a genuine. He believes in the um, in Caribbean musicians. He believes that you know he wants to play with musicians. I mean, the thing is, he's not gonna play with everybody. Right. He might play with everyone, but he has he wants to play a certain type of thing, and I'm glad that he's you know willing to play that type of repertoire um, with what we do. You know, so I mean, Frankie, I mean, I've never called a song. I don't think Frankie didn't know. Hmm. <laughs> you know, so it's like, right. so he knows the whole songbook. That, you know, he wrote a lot of the Caribbean songbook, right. at least of the 70s into the 80s. Right. And the American jazz, you know, so he would know everything from the quirkiest monk song to an R&B song. He's going to know the whole Wayne Shorter thing. You know, so that's rare. You know, a guy is doing teaser, and now he's playing Trinkle Tinkle for Monk. It's like this dude is different, right? Right. <laughs> you know, so so he that was a with him and and Bradley that was really um, I can say myself really lucky to, mm. but Frankie had a bigger impact on me as an improviser. Mm. Bradley, I learned some of the arranging things. You know how Bradley, I, I can't say I learned how Bradley would do it because. Only Bradley knows how we do it. I think I was able to maybe steal an idea here or there and try to spin it in my own way. So lastly, I just want to talk about like um, your your presence online and like your 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 appreciation you get from the people. A lot of people are embracing your music, your playing. Like just just speak about that and your perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, when, whenever we play, I try to share something. We haven't been able to get good videos. Um, we've been playing at Barbay, which is a, I guess, a, a jazz club on, on up on Nostra, and then we do the sugar. It's, I mean, it's appreciated. You know, it's hard to tell online if people are appreciating what you're doing. I, I don't count likes because mm -hmm. a lot of times, what I may like may not get the interaction <laughs> that that other people might. Um, I think what what is done for me it's probably gotten my name, I wouldn't say out there, because I'm still, I don't consider myself a known pan person, you know, but it, it allowed me to reach some people who wouldn't have been aware of me, 
and it's not a big people, maybe I think maybe 20, 25 people. But I think at the end of the day, I, I want to document what I did, good, bad, indifferent. This is what we did. You know, some people may say, oh, it's not the best video. It may not be the best video, but that's what we were playing. Right. You know, so I'm more into, I stand behind. People don't have to like it. Some people might, some, but this is what we're playing. And there's some honesty with the videos. This is not edited. This is not, this is, these guys said one, two, three, and this is what they sounded like. Right. People in the background, people walking. So for me, it's, it's been great. As I said, I could, at some point, I'll probably go in the studio and have something more controlled where the sound is better and the lighting. Right, right. But, and I think Frankie agrees. It's like, this is really documenting art in the spur of the moment. And to me, that's the spirit of improvisation to me. I don't consider myself a jazz musician per se, because the jazz guys might say that's not jazz. But I think what I'm doing and what the band is doing, we're creating music on the fly. And whatever I put up is, yeah, that's what, that's what happened, guys. This is, I didn't go and say, let's do this again. This is like we counted it. And so I think there's, for me, there's, there's merit in that. There's merit in the sanitized version too, where you want your product and your visuals to be, to be good. But um, so long answer. <laughs> some people may like it, some people may not. It was a pleasure interviewing you. Um, any closing remarks? Anything you, any message you got for the people? Now, first, thanks for, um, for having me be part of your, your series. I, mean, I watched the first part with um, Spots at Good Fitzgerald. That, that was enlightening. I don't really have any major message. Just people that keep supporting the art form, going out there and, and, and supporting in whichever way you can. And keep sharing the music and sharing the love. You know, other than that, uh, I'm good. I think the art form is going to keep going. It's one of these things. It's resilient. It'll just remake itself, come back in different forms. Um, it may not be my vision, but, you know, so, so I'm, I'm comfortable that the art form is going to, is going to be there in whatever shape or form it's, it's been resilient for, I mean, 70 years and wherever country it lands in, it, it, um, it takes root and it gets people engaged. So that I'm, I'm hopeful that that continues and, you know, everybody just keeps sharing music. That's what I plan to do. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, comment, share, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos. Pan Roots Culture.